Welcome to the CES meeting. It is the 4th of January, our first CES meeting of the year 2023, the third year of 2020. Um, uh, today for the, our, our topic, uh, we intend to do a security review of async context. Mark has made a PR that does an exploration into that topic. Um, a lot of us are not paged into this very closely. So uh, Mark has offered to give us a guided review as a uh, way to open the topic. So Mark. Yeah, um, hold on, bringing it up. Okay, I have the PR in front of me. So while Mark's busy, all those in favor of renaming FAR or EXO to PET. I abstain. No. <laughs> no? No. No? No. Pet yeah. is great for some other purpose than this, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I'm I, I'm against, and since I'm on the Zoom call twice, I'm going to vote both, both of my presences. <laughs> I fi I'm finally using this to engage in an actual civil attack. I'm resisting the temptation today. <laughs> It looks so. It looks like uh, it looks like the nays have it. Um, looks like the nays have a lot of uh, things uh, lately. Okay. Uh, is can people see that screen? We are visible. Yes. It looks okay. like a web browser showing GitHub in Sith mode. And is in what mode? Sith mode, you know, the dark side. Ah, I've never heard it called that. That's very memorable. <laughs> and um, uh, so I suppose, uh, is everybody watching it on a big screen or should I make the font? I can just make it much bigger. Okay, how about that? Yeah, that's, that's better. Okay. Much, much better, thank you. Okay, hi, Peter. Hey, Mark. Okay, so um, so the the thing that's going on here is that um, uh, Justin Ridgewell uh, and um, and others have been um, uh, uh, pushing for uh, uh, Legendacast in, in particular, um, and I believe with. Um, uh, little Dan also uh, helping have been pushing for a proposal that, that they call uh, async context. Uh, it's um, uh, essentially an extension of fluid. I'll, I'll, I'll be explaining these terms, but but let me just make the. I'll I'll state the term the. I'll state it in the terms that need to be explained. Um, it's it's essentially a form of fluid scoping, uh, but extended by magic through then, uh, through the uh, use of then to create new terms. And fluid scoping itself is a obscure term, which is why I'll, I'll need to uh, precisely explain it. Um, uh, uh, fluid scoping uh, was introduced as a disciplined alternative to dynamic scoping, which I'll also explain. Um, uh, the thing about fluid scoping is that it does, is that fluid scoping itself does not violate object capability rules. I'm also going to uh, use the distinction that came up recently in a thread with uh, Dan Connolly um, uh, between object capability rules and object capability discipline. From the point of view of object capability discipline, um, of you know, doing using object cap, which is a, a you know, programming practices, which is a heuristic issue, things like principle of least authority, which depends on you know what on, on subjective measures of like what the job is supposed to be that you're that you're authorizing. Um, uh, you can it's it's um, One can argue that fluid scoping, even though it satisfies the rules, is bad discipline. It leads to 
effectively implicit parameterization uh, as a you know, way to, to bring about the effect of implicit parameterization uh, rather than keeping all parameters explicit. So what so, you're saying is it obeys the letter of the law, but not the spirit of it? That's right, that's right. It obeys the letter of the law, but not the spirit of it. Uh, but hardened JavaScript as a mechanism is only uh, there to obey, the, to enforce the letter of the law. Uh, it can't enforce the spirit. Um, and therefore hardened JavaScript itself cannot prohibit fluid scoping, just like no OCAP language in general can prohibit fluid scoping. Okay, now, um, uh, but then the way in which um, you can do fluid scoping inside the rules uh, of OCAPs is um, the rules create restrictions of uh, such that you can't then extend the overall context through then um, uh, uh, so the so what they're proposing is both to introduce fluid scoping into the language um, which is done by their um, explanatory smaller proposal sync scoping uh, but then introduce a magic mechanism to extend it through then, and that magic mechanism can only be implemented by breaking the OCAP rules. Uh, then the hypothesis, which, we're, which we all need to examine, is that even though async scoping breaks the rules that we've written down, uh, it doesn't break the reason why we've arrived at those rules. And that's a very, very subtle and dangerous hypothesis, which is why I've added a, a gazillion reviewers onto this and I want us to proceed very carefully. Um, because we arrived at the object capability rules um, uh, for many reasons and having worked with those rules, we found that it is beneficial for many, many, many reasons. And to recapitulate all of the reasons why the object capability rules are beneficial and test them against something that breaks the rules that we've written down, uh, it's very easy for us to miss some safety reason that, that we, that the object capability rules support that these weakened, um, that this weakening of those rules break, uh, but that we just didn't think of because it's hard, very hard to work backward from the rule to everything that we found that the rule supports. Okay, um, so now to, to take this apart some. Um, dynamic scoping, uh, was originated with the original uh, list languages before scheme. Uh, so McCarthy's list that started from the 50s uh, all the way through common list were all using dynamic scoping. And what dynamic scoping uh, is, is that when a name is used, uh, you look instead of looking up the, the you know, instead of finding the the the, um, the binding occur the binding occurrence of the name if, instead of finding the, the value associated with the name by looking lexically up the 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 the, um, the you know the textually outer um, uh, lexical context uh, instead you look up the stack you look backward up the stack through earlier call frames until you find some stack frame that has defined uh, a binding for that variable. So it's, um, and it, it's surprising that it lasted so long because you know, from, from modern, modern eyeballs, it's so obviously completely unstructured and non-modular, uh, which it in fact is, um, uh, so uh, then through uh, really um, 
mostly through Carl Hewitt, there is a rediscovery of, of the power of doing lambda calculus with proper lexical scoping and the power of doing genuine lambda languages with lexical scoping. And that eventually uh, inspired by actors turned into the scheme language and the scheme language in turn inf influenced uh, essentially all modern programming languages to only do lexical scoping. And lexical scoping, uh, and that's also the discovery of, that fits with the discovery of object capability languages. Doing um, uh, lexical scoping uh, also supports treating uh, lambda calculus with local side effects as, a, as an object capability system, uh, once you get rid of the other rule breaking things like global state. Um, so, um, so, you know, what we're doing very much descends from lambda calculus with local side effects as supported by lexical scoping and uh, no global mutable state. Um, uh, then it, within the scheme community, uh, they discovered a pattern for rebuilding some of the power that some of them missed from dynamic scoping, which they called fluid scoping. Uh, and um, uh, so now I'm going to shift to one of the files here that I, so this PR, I should talk about this PR first. Oh, actually I should do it by this readme. Okay, so in the PR we'll be looking at, um, I examine the case for async context. I steel man the case for async context to the point that I'm, I'm almost half convinced myself. And this is the thing I want us to examine. Um, by going, by, by um, uh, going through um, the proposal's explanatory code for explaining the semantics of their API. And I take it through six um, uh, variants. Uh, and it's the second variant that shows fluid scoping. So I'm going to start actually with that, and then I'll come back here and go through uh, the, the six version, the six examples in order. But <clears throat> this one does simple fluid scoping. Um, it has the semantics of fluid scoping. It, it um, does not extend through then, so it only has the, sync, the normal synchronous semantics of fluid scoping, which is why it's called sync context, and not async context. And it does it um, with code that is perfectly well supported by, hard, by hardened JavaScript as it should be. And uh, even though uh, I would generally advocate against using this, uh, I certainly advocate that hardened JavaScript should continue to allow it. And this is the distinction between the rules versus the discipline. Okay, so the API here is that sync context is, a, is assumed to be a primordial. It's a top level uh, export from this module where the module is trying to shim a corresponding primordial. So, so, so interpret this under the hypothesis that sync context is a primordial, uh, a whitelisted primordial, and is therefore uh, accessible to everyone. And therefore, it itself must not have any mutable static state. Uh, in order to account for it as not having mutable static state, um, uh, I, I need to explain about the private instance variable here. There's when a class in, in a class in JavaScript has private instance variable. Uh, there's two ways to account for that, which is that it's state of the instance, mutable state of the instances of the class, in which case the, mut the mutability is only in the instance, and that's the reading of that that I'm going to ask for here. 
that, that still leaves the class itself transitively immutable and powerless. Um, so what's going on here is this is a mutable, mutable instance state, the state variable. What run does is it stacks bindings to that state and it, and it calls a callback, CB is callback, uh, using the new current binding of the state. So it basically says whatever the current value of the state is for this instance of sync context, uh, put stack put that in a in a previous variable. Basically, hide it in this call frame on the stack. Then put this this value as the current value of state. Then um, call the callback with these args, where the args default to uh, the empty argument list. So just so the args are not really interesting here. They're just a um, convenience so that, you, uh, um, so that you don't always have to thunkify. Um, uh, uh, and then once, once that's done, whether it's done, whether, it's, whether the callback finishes by returning uh, normally or by throwing, in either case, restore the previous stack state. And, uh, and if at any time, and so the, so the uh, sync context instance also supports this other operation called get that returns the current binding of the state variable. So now let me explain question, how this is. Clarifying question? Yeah. Um, so the presumption here is that the, the code that, that callback CB refers to is code that somewhere in its lexical scope has access to the sync context instance? That is exactly the right, it, the right question. Um, uh, it, 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 is, uh, it is for exactly that. So the answer is yes, um, uh, but it's the difference between, it's the fact that the sync context instance is a genuine capability is what makes this more what makes fluid scoping more um, disciplined than dynamic scoping. So in dynamic scoping, the dynamic variable was simply a variable name. So the access to it was you know anybody who could who who, who wrote down the name, who could spell the name, which is everyone of course, uh, would then have access to the current stacked value of the variable could, you know, could look up the variable by looking up the dynamic stack. What fluid scoping does is it says, instead of the dynamic variable being a textual variable name that anybody can write, instead, let's turn um, the access to a given uh, fluid variable into a first class capability that one either has or does not have. So by creating a new sync context instance, you're creating a new fluid variable. So if, if no one gives you that sync context instance, you cannot observe the fluid variable. If you do have the sync context instance, then you can access the current state of the variable, you know, the tops, the, 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 the value at the top of the stack. Um, and what you can also do is you can uh, rebind it for a new dynamic context, a dyna dynamic context in the sense that it's temporal. Uh, so dynamic, dynamic in the sense of dynamic scoping can be understood as temporal. Uh, uh, whereas lex lexical is, is static or textual. Um, in lexical scoping, you've got the, sco the scope of, let's say, a shadow, shadow, when you shadow a variable, the scope is starting at a given place in the, you know, start, starting, you know, conceptually at an open curly bracket and ending at the, at the closed curly bracket. And, and 
And outside of that interval, in the next outer interval, there's some previous binding of the variable. So, you, so the shadowing is kind of nested intervals of text over which the variable is bound. Dynamic scoping following the stack, uh, you can think of that as, as being uh, temporal intervals that, um, uh, that the binding of um, the state variable to val happens starting at the beginning of the execution of the callback and ending when the callback uh, completes, whether it completes with a return or a throw. Uh, and then outside of that interval is restored the previous binding that is in scope for the previous interval. So the, the analogy of nested temporal intervals uh, to nested textual intervals is actually you know, a very nice analogy for thinking about this. Uh, and it also explains um, why this code implements something very analogous to dynamic scoping, which is this uh, nested interval binding of a, a variable to a value. Uh, but by what we mean by a fluid variable is not a variable name. It is the sync context instance itself represents the fluid variable. Um, uh, and, and frankly, even, even in object capability systems, I have found myself writing such nested changes of state occasionally, um, but I'm always very suspicious of it if I find myself writing code where security is at all a concern and there's mutual suspicion among the things being coordinated. Okay, so uh, before I go on from this, really, this is sort of the really foundational, it's important uh, that, that we all really understand this before we go on. So any questions? No, I, I think one thing that really clicked is that um, your description of it as a temporal variable. Uh, basically a variable that holds a specific value during uh, wh while a certain uh, function is on the stack. Yes. Okay, good. Good. So the, from the proposal uh, are, two p are two pieces of code that I've adapted um, into uh, sync context original.js, uh, which intended to really uh, have the same explanatory context, content as the proposals slide six. And then async context original.js, which is based on the proposals slide 11 and slide 13, and is supposed to have the same explanatory context as the two of them together. Um, and what they're proposing is, is, is essentially, is, I mean, the, 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 the API they're proposing is async context original, is represented by, is explained by async context original.js. Um, uh, but the reason they're starting with sync context original is to say, um, uh, look, here's, here's one that's, that's just dealing with the synchronous case and seems fine by all of the safety criteria that any that that you know, that 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 we would come up with, uh, and they're sort of right in the sense that um, sync context original is observably exactly equivalent to sync context shallow, which is what we we're just looking at. They're sort of wrong in the sense that sync context original is uh, written uh, in a is implemented is you know it, uh, implements the same API the same semantics the same context shallow, but it does it in a way that breaks the rules the OCAP rules, uh, and therefore without sync context shallow looking at it we should be suspicious of it. 
Uh, and the difference re is, is, uh, reflects a difference in the way the old LISPs would implement dynamic binding. There was two, two implementation techniques for dynamic binding called deep binding and shallow binding. Deep binding is where the LISP started, uh, where it would do exactly what I described in the implementation, uh, which is when looking up a, a when, uh, when executing a variable use, a variable use expression, foo, uh, it would actually go to the stack and look back on the actual call stack and look, look at every um, uh, uh, variable definition on the call stack until it found a variable definition uh, you know, uh, for that variable. Uh, and that of course had a significant runtime cost. A different technique was shallow binding, which essentially does what we were seeing with uh, sync context shallow, which is for every textual name, there was a location in memory and the rebinding of that um, the, the, the binding of that uh, within a function was um, really just stacked the previous value, uh, uh, you know, hit it in the call frame, uh, changed the, the global location, and then restored it on procedure exit. Um, if anyone's familiar with uh, prologue implementations, the implementation of backtracking in most prologue engines is, is, very, is a very analogous kind of shallow binding. It, it's, um, okay. So, so with all of that said, let's take a look at sync context. Oh, sorry. And the reason they're starting there is because they're correctly intuited that sync, sync context original is actually safe by anybody's safety criteria. Um, uh, uh, and then what they do is having, per, having shown this, they then show this that takes the rule violating global state from sync context original. They use that rule violating global state and they then make use of it to extend the, the, the context through them. And they're extending the context through then in the way that you cannot write by following the OCAP rules in a OCAP language. This, this one cannot be transformed away into safety. Um, uh, and the question is, is it safe enough anyway? That's sort of the, the big question that we're going to be examining. Okay. Um, and then what these intermediate files are about is um, in order to make the strongest case that I can for sync, for um, the semantics shown by async context original is I transform async context original into async context weak transpose that still violates the OCAP rules but is trying to do that in a way that, that um, minimizes the implications of the rule violation so that we can most narrowly think about what the dangers are to the security properties we care about created by that rule violation. Um, uh, that all seems, uh, you know, while all of that came out of my mouth, it sounded sort of uh, vague and hard to follow. Um, uh, uh, I think what's probably best is for me to go on with the concrete specifics and then ask for questions. Okay, I saw a thumbs up there, thank you. Okay, so sync context original, um, is uh, close enough to their uh, slide six. Um, uh, and what this does is 
it starts off with a global mutable, a, 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 a hidden global mutable variable named Dunderbar storage. <coughs> and it's encapsulated by sync context. Um, uh, nothing outside of this file can directly access or modify this variable, but it is a let binding. So the, and the variable does get assigned to exactly here. Uh, well, exactly here and here rather, but interestingly here on line 17. Um, and the reason, so even though it's hidden, the way in which this is rule violating is sync, the module is intended to be a shim for a proposed primordial. Sync context is proposed as a whitelisted and therefore assumed powerful primordial. But even after hardening it, um, the, by the way, I just realized something that I didn't do with all of these examples I need to go back through and do, which is introduce a constructor that hardens the instance of sync, uh, sync context, um, because it, the, there's still leftover mutability on the instances here in these examples. And that's just an artifact of, I missed it in transforming their code. Um, uh, and therefore I've left ex excess mutability on the table that's beyond what I'm trying to explain. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, as, a, um, as a primordial, it should be the case that once we harden it, it's now completely immutable and powerless. And to emphasize this, uh, this code subject to uh, Peter's, you know, Peter and Patrick's uh, purity checker would fail the purity checker. It would sync context is impure because it captures this mutable variable. Um, uh, and in fact, it, it both reads and mutates that variable. And Peter, since you're here, let me verify that in fact, your purity checker would check on this. Absolutely, we see that uh, warning in our embedded builds all the time. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Okay. So um, what uh, this thing is doing is it's mirroring the deep binding uh, implementation of dynamic scoping. Uh, normally fluid scoping, nobody talks about deep binding implementations of fluid scoping. Um, uh, but this, uh, but this, that is exactly what this is doing. Let me talk through how it is doing it. Um, the, um, since the, the sync context instance represents the fluid variable, um, the, I'm going to take a, a moment to gather my thoughts here. Mm. Right. What is bound to storage is It looks like it's it's the active context for every instance of this class. For every instance of this class, right. right. Um, so I'm actually going to say this is not the 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 if I was trying to explain deep binding, this would not be the code that I would do. I would actually have storage hold on to a stack. Um, uh, uh, so there's a later transposed version of this that is actually the best explanation of the deep binding implementation. Um, what this is doing is rather than stacking and unstacking each individual variable, it's stacking and unstacking into this global storage variable, a map holding the fluid bindings 
of all of the fluid variables. So each, each of these maps, uh, um, each map holds uh, the current context, which is a binding from all fluid variables to their values. Uh, and if a fluid, and, and notice by the way, that uh, let's actually go back to the simpler, simpler version over here first, make another point about the semantics there, which is one, can, one could create a sync context instance, um, uh, not call run and just call get. So you could call get while there is no fluid context, in which case state, it would just be return, in which case get would just return undefined. So there's kind of an implicit pervasive outer interval, outer temporal interval outside of the first call to run in which state is bound to undefined. Okay, so likewise over here, this storage, the storage, the outer thing here has no map. It's just bound to undefined. Um, and it's only within run where we bind uh, storage uh, to a new map. New map here bounds next, and then next sort of storage. But we do first is um, we uh, remember the previous binding of storage, the previous map. Um, in the new map, we override just the binding of this one variable um, so that uh, within the new temporal context, uh, if storage is bound to a map, uh, then we get the binding, you know, then we get the result of a get on that, which still might be undefined, still might not be bound uh, in that map, the but this is this is to, this storage and and is say if store if we're in the very outer uh, temporal interval where storage is unbound, that will also give us an undefined. Um, the so so what this is doing is it's is basically just doing this. It's really doing the same kind of sh of shallow binding implementation but switching all of the fluid variables at once rather than switching them individually. And the reason why this is a map rather than a weak map is it seems like it could be a weak map because the only operations we're doing on it is set and get. By the way, can everybody see my cursor moving around? Okay, good. Uh, but the other thing we're doing on it is this thing over here, which is um, uh, we're, we're in order to stack them, we're completely we're copying the old map into the new map. Now remember that, that, that uh, we're only rebinding the variables. We're not we're never assigning to them the fluid variables, only binding the fluid variables over at the beginning of the temporal inter interval. We're never, these are not considered like a const variable being over a textual interval, but not being assigned within the interval. Uh, in this implementation of fluid scoping, uh, it's only bound over a temporal interval, but not assigned during the temporal interval. And therefore copying the maps here is a perfectly reasonable uh, implementation. Um, okay, now the, oh, um, yeah, this is the first time trying to talk through all of this in words. I'm finding myself doing some self-correcting as I go. When I showed this, I showed, I said, this is not the, really the best expl explanation of deep, of a deep binding implementation, uh, which was correct. And then I said that a later stage, the transpose is the proper showing the deep binding implementation. That was wrong. Uh, it's the later stage is what I'm about to get to next, which is what's needed to turn this from a map into a weak map. So, so I'm about to show the thing that's actually the best explanation for a deep binding implementation of fluid scoping, which is, uh, I'm, going to, I'm, go, I'm going to just go to this inline one. Okay, which is this one. So 
in order to use a weak map rather than a map, uh, we, can, we have to not, no longer flatten the old map into the new map. So since we can't flatten the old map into the new map, what we're going to do instead is we're going to keep a linked list of maps. And the, we're just, and just for, for, for simplicity, for brevity, um, uh, each element of the linked list will actually just be the get, a get function. So a get fun the get function is something that takes a key and returns either undefined or the new value. Um, so, um, and, it, and the way in which the, the get function is like a element of a linked list of maps is it captures a current map and it captures a previous get function. Um, so just like a console in a linked list captures a current value and captures the previous list. Um, so uh, the get function, if the current map has the key, then return the value bound to the key in the current map. Otherwise, invoke the previous get function. And in order to start all this off, the, the tail the tail of all of these lists is simply a get function that always returns undefined for all keys. Um, so now, um, uh, what our uh, um, what our run function does in order to stack uh, uh, is is it simply is simply um, uh, 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 pushes onto the top of this get stack a new get function, which is exactly this function on line 14, that looks things up in a new weak map. This new weak map, by the way, the interesting, bizarre thing about this implementation technique that Dean pointed out to me is that each weak map in the stack has exactly one binding. So, um, so this stack with pushing and popping um, uh, represents what list, old list programmers would call an association list. It's just really just a linked list of, uh, of pairs where each pair represents a key value binding. Um, and the reason why we use a linked list rather than just use a pair here uh, is it sets us up for the next transform. Um, but uh, otherwise, this can just be understood as pushing and popping a new key value pair onto a linked list of key value pairs. And because we're pushing and popping, it's most obvious that we're tre treating this as a, um, uh, as a stack. So, um, Pardon uh, <laughs> So in the step in, uh, in achieving this particular transformation of the previous code, we've lost constant time access. I'm not, I'm not, so yeah, let me, let me completely waive. None of this is concerned with actual implementation costs. Yeah. Other, uh, other than explaining history. So, so, but we, so in any case, we lose constant time access, but we gain in exchange immutability at the, or the purity of the sync context constructor. Um, do we also gain no. a better? All right, go ahead. The so or maybe hold on. Do we? Oh, uh, oh, we do. No, you're correct. You're exactly correct. I didn't notice that. How how totally bizarre. This should be const right here on line eight. With that being left, no, it will still no, fail no, no, Peter's no, 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 checker. Wrong. And it's I'm just wrong. because of. And line, line nine, lines 19 and 16 mean that I'm wrong on that point. Get is getting reassigned uh, to whatever the active top. Ha oh, oh, no, no, you're, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, well, okay. So we don't gain that. Do we gain a garbage collection behavior from this? Because we're holding... We do. We do gain a garbage collection behavior from this. Uh, which if, if, the, if the stack were just a linked list of key value pairs, then uh, dropping a sync context instance 
would not enable the car the value bound to that in, the values bound to that instance to disappear because every one of the stack bindings to the fluid variable to the same context instance is held in a weak map um, then if the sync context instance is garbage collected then each of uh, the the pairs themselves the pairs in the list still are still there they don't get collected but the but the value uh, held by that pair i'm sorry the the element the, the i'm sorry not the pairs there the the weak map represents the 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 depth of the linked list of weak maps remains. The weak map doesn't get collected, but each weak map is just binding a single sync context instance to a corresponding value. And if the sync context instance disappears, then the weak map goes empty and the value disappears. Okay. So we've gained, so the purpose of this transform is presumably to gain that GC behavior and to set us up for the next transform. Right. And, I, and I'm truly... not convinced that we actually gain that though, because the, the, the weak map only exists in the linked list during execution of run. And during that time, it's probably not collectible. You can probably make it by transforming this code a little bit, but it's more of an implementation detail. Yeah. All right. So we're set up for another transform, and I, I gather that that's the primary reason for the transform. Yeah. So the, so certainly the reason I wrote this was only to set us up for the next transform. My motivation was not garbage collection. Um, and, and for actual implementations, Richard is probably right that because of the stacking, the, the stacked access um, to the sync context instance deeper in the stack, um, there's probably no collection going on. Um, so okay. I, I quite understand why this is uh, safe since we have a global get that does that. Yeah, that access. So, so this is safe in the same sense that the original is safe. This is a let. I, I was I, 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 in the suggestion that this was in, uh, immutable. I went off on a. Um, I got just got totally confused. So, but we a, we but, haven't but, shown but, that the original. Was safe. I'm sorry. We haven't shown that the original is safe. We've shown that the original is safe. Well, we've claimed that the original is safe by saying that the original is observably equivalent to this. It, this, would, this, code would pass, this code, given that the purity checker uh, understands the state variable as being associated with the, as being mutability associated with the instance and not the class. And since Peter's here, I'll ask him. Uh, Peter, would your, would, what would your purity checker say about this code? This code, it shouldn't have, I don't think it should have anything to say, right? Because the private variable hasn't been instantiated. Yeah, it should be fine. Right, if it was a static, it was a static private, it would be a problem. Okay, so the, the, the reason why, uh, why it's a tricky question and why, why I asked you about your pretty checker is if this same class was a subclass and the superclass was doing return override, then, I mean, let's say the superclass was just a function that, you know, that if th this class was just simply a subclass of a function that returned a primordial, for example, then this code would no longer be pure. Yay. Yeah. Uh, it's, we're getting close to the hour. I need to raise a point of order. Do oh my god, oh my god, we're getting close to the hour, and I, I... and we've only begun. Clearly, uh, yes, <laughs> um, we've only begun. Wow, Mark, uh, do you wish? Uh, so I need to drop off and attend the endo meeting. Do you wish to continue this and just uh, leave us to all review the recording? Uh, or those of us who have to leave to, re to review the recording, or would you like to? No, I, I would prefer to, to, to continue this. 
it's much more important to get this right than it is to get this fast. Um, okay. uh, so I would prefer to resume when we can get this crowd together. Um, how close are we? Oh my God, we're close. Um, so let me, let me uh, I'm going to do a one minute quick thing and then uh, show and then uh, and to get to the punchline, which is uh, you've all heard me go on and on and on about transposed um, uh, representations of weak maps. So this does the corresponding transpose here. In the transpose, the keys, the, we still have a linked list, but the linked list is just a linked list of, uh, of empty keys representing identities. Uh, so we're still, it's still a let, we're still stacking these things by assigning to the keys variable, but there's no mutable state um, uh, accessible from the values of keys. Each individual binding of keys is pure, but sync context is still impure because it closes over the keys variable, which is assigned. Um, but this so far is still equivalent to our, um, our shallow binding implementation, which is, which is safe. And therefore we claim that this is still safe, even though it breaks the rules. Um, Uh, async context, the, the let and the async context code, all of this is identical to the one that you were just seeing that, we, that I said is safe. Uh, but then in order to extend it through then, they add this additional wrap operation, which is understood as only being used by the internal then function that makes use of the same glo mutable global state here. Um, in fact, it, by, to, to, to grab the overall async context consisting of all of the bindings of all fluid scopes and to propagate that through a then so that the nested temporal contexts aren't literal time, but are nested time uh, as in um, uh, if turn A spawns turn B, then turn B, the entirety of turn B is thought of as nested in the temporal interval uh, at the point that turn A um, uh, registered the, call, the then callbacks that would be called to, um, to cause turn B. Okay, that's it. All right, uh, we'll follow up on this next time. Um, thanks for laying the foundation for our future understanding of the totality of the problem. <laughs> uh, thanks again, Mark.